Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. I'm uh, Ricardo Valadez. I'm the private equity campaign manager uh, at Americans for Financial Reform. I'm gonna share a screen with you. We're gonna do a little presentation. Uh, we'll look at the agenda, do some introductions, and then I'll turn it up, uh, turn it over to our esteemed guest, Robert Seifert, who will walk you through uh, a presentation of uh, private equity in healthcare and uh, uh, the the opportunity to take action here to, against private equity in healthcare. So uh, we'll do some introductions. Uh, we'll talk about combating private equity in nursing homes. Uh, we'll talk about um, how you can join the fight and some ways you can take action uh, immediately. Uh, and then we'll leave plenty of time for a question and answer. I'm Ricardo Valadez. I'm with Americans for Financial Reform. For folks who are not familiar with Americans for Financial Reform, we are a nonpartisan and nonprofit coalition of over 200 civil rights, consumer, labor, business, investor, faith-based, faith and civic and community groups. Uh, we were formed in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis, and we're working to lay the foundation of, uh, for a strong, stable, and ethical financial system, one that serves the economy and the nation as a whole. Uh, we've been called the leading voice for Wall Street uh, accountability in Washington uh, by the Huffington Post, and uh, we welcome you today. Um, so uh, again, for those not familiar with our work fighting private equity, um, uh, just a quick snapshot. Um, you know, we at AFR, we, you know, fight uh, to, to create a strong financial system that, re that, um, that is responsive to people and not just uh, billionaires. Uh, and over the past uh, two decades, uh, the once obscure private equity industry has ballooned in size from a trillion dollars uh, in 2008 to nearly 4.5 trillion in 20, 2021. So obviously that uh, has impacted the economy tremendously um, as they have expanded uh, into many different aspects of the economy. Uh, millions of people in the United States have been directly impacted uh, whether it's at, at their jobs, um, in housing, uh, and as Bob will get into, uh, in patient care. Um, now, let me introduce uh, Robert Seifert. He's a senior fellow with us at AFR, um, and uh, uh, he's a, a public policy professional with over 30 years of experience in the public sector, nonprofit, and university settings. He, his primary focus is health care policy and uh, programs that seek to improve access uh, to care and correct uh, inequalities in, in health care delivery outcomes. Uh, I'll let you read the, the rest of um, Bob's bio here. Uh, we're very excited to work with him. Uh, he's been helping us um, uh, really dig into uh, private equity in, in healthcare and how we can attack it. And so we're uh, and uh, we will make available um, a copy of this presentation, um, as well as a, a video of the webinar uh, for you to review and, and share with colleagues as well. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to Bob. Thank you, uh, Ricardo. Uh, and thank you for not um, reading that whole bio. Um, that um, would have been taken up more time than was necessary. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, it's it's uh, great to be he here with you today to talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing with AFR on private equity and healthcare, and to talk specifically about the um, uh, the proposed rule that is uh, uh, accepting comments now that uh, we would love for you to uh, sign on to uh, uh, our comments if, if uh, you haven't already done that. Um, I want to start with a uh, with a higher level view before we get to the discussion of the rule um, about just private equity and healthcare in general. That's the topic of this slide. Private equity is incom incompatible with healthcare. We argue um, the main purpose of private equity investment, as uh, I'm sure most of you know, is uh, to make money, um, and uh, and very often that is uh, incompatible with the uh, with the purposes of of healthcare, the methods that private equity owners of healthcare uh, facilities and uh, physician practices um, use to make money uh, is often uh, threatening to 
uh, the quality and safety of healthcare. And there's uh, voluminous literature, peer reviewed literature demonstrating uh, this fact. The, the approach that private equity often uses, uh, leverage buyouts, debt financing, uh, settles, uh, uh, put, puts, uh, puts a large burden of debt onto the uh, acquired businesses, the, the, the healthcare facilities, nursing facilities, hospitals, physician practices, and so forth, uh, that the private equity investors buy. Um, and they also often uh, will sell off the real estate that the facility owns and then lease it back in, again, a money uh, a money making move, but that also at the same time imposes financial burdens on the institution, uh, threatening its viability of operating and also diverting the resources that they might otherwise have to devote to patient care. Um, private equity is usually in it for the short term. Uh, they invest in businesses, acquire new businesses, accumulate uh, resources around a, a, a portfolio, and then exit the, the, the investment within five to seven years. That is not conducive to healthcare. Healthcare improvement uh, is a serious long-term business that requires dedication and, uh, and, and, and building of uh, 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 of trust, of resources, of uh, of uh, practices within a facility that the strategy for private investment is is really in in total conflict with. Um, the evidence of this is, as I mentioned, pretty widespread. In particular, uh, these bullets on this slide uh, are evidence about private equity ownership of nursing facilities and its impact on the facilities and residents. Um, you can see here that there's a study that has shown that uh, private equity ownership is associated with an increased mortality rate, equivalent to about 20,000 additional lives lost due to private equity ownership over a 12 year period of this study. Higher probability of receiving antipsychotic medications among residents, uh, less availability of, of nursing services within the facility. Uh, other measures such as patient mobility and pain intensity uh, get, get worse. Um, while the total amounts billed, again, in this money-making uh, uh, effort, uh, the total amount bill, billed to Medicare increases over this period. So um, this particular study is mentioned specifically in the preamble to the rule, the proposed rule that we're going to talk about, was also mentioned or referred to by President Biden in his State of the Union address last year in 2022, uh, where he raised the issue of, of private equity in healthcare and uh, uh, dedicated actions of his administration to, uh, to, to combating some of these uh, ill effects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the lack of transparency exacerbates the problem. And by lack of transparency, I mean, we don't really know who the owners of these facilities are. They're, they're shrouded maybe layers away from the, the, the facility itself. They're not listed necessarily in corporate records as the official or, or the, the actual owners of a facility. Uh, it's very difficult in many cases to tell and that's that's by uh, by intent. That's 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 not an accident. Uh, and this rule is uh, intended to to overcome some of that uh, lack of transparency. The lack of transparency shields the owners from accountability. The uh, these owners are driving their activity driving the activity these places. There is an imperative here that's very clear to all who work there that the point is to turn a profit, a large profit. Um, and the, these owners are not accountable for the effects of the operational changes that 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 are that are made in order to pursue that profit. Uh, it facilitates stealth consolidation. I mentioned briefly that the 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 business model is to uh, accumulate smaller businesses, put them all together uh, in, in a way that eludes antitrust. Uh, scrutiny, so federal antitrust uh, uh, enforcement uh, actions, 
because they're too small and in an individual transaction sense, but as they build, the, the facility is able to, um, uh, to, to exert more market power, uh, to increase prices while quality reduces as, as, as market influence increases. And all of this happens uh, kind of below the radar so that, so that we don't really know what's going on until maybe it's too late to do anything about it. Uh, and then uh, we also don't know about overlapping ownership or common owners across a number of facilities or the relationships that owners might have with uh, management companies or staffing companies that actually help to operate the facilities, which, which could yield information about patterns in quality or substandard quality um, and also helps people make choices. You're making choices about where your where your loved ones are going to go into nursing homes. If you know that a, a, a the owner of a nursing home over here uh, is, is is responsible for poor quality care, you'd like to know that that owner whether that owner is owning owns the nursing homes that you're considering as well. So, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, has proposed a regulation or rule on uh, transparency of nursing facility ownership, the disclosure of, of the owners, uh, requiring the disclosure of, of nursing facility ownership. Basically, this is, uh, this is a, uh, the implementation of a federal law. So the federal law was passed um, actually in 2010. It was part of the uh, Affordable Care Act, giving CMS the authority to collect this ownership information. Then the, the next step in the process is that the agency issues the, uh, the rule describing how it will implement the law. Um, in this case, it's taken a very long time because uh, initially CMS uh, proposed a rule in 2011 that was later, it was never finalized. It was pulled back probably because of, uh, of opposition from various stakeholders. Uh, this proposed rule, and there's a uh, there's uh, I think we now have in the chat a link to the to the to the rule itself. If 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 you haven't had a look at it yet, but this rule is being issued now specifically because, and CMS says this in in its uh, in, in its preamble to the rule, which is all of this information that's in the Federal Register. Because, because of the information it has received regarding particular categories of nursing facility owners. So it's singling out or doubling out in this case, uh, private equity companies and real estate investment trusts that have generated concerns about the standard of care that nursing facility residents receive. So the, that evidence that I cited from that study earlier uh, was is is brought to bear in, in, in as a as an explanation for why CMS is now coming back and and reissuing this rule about disclosure of ownership. The proposed the the rule was proposed uh, in mid February. There's a 60 day uh, public comment period. This is standard. Uh, that 60 day period closes on April 14th. Uh, so all comments need to be received by then. Uh, after that, CMS will consider all of the comments, and we hope uh, it ultimately come back with a final rule that will require uh, nursing facilities to do uh, the following, if I could have the next slide. So these are the details of the proposed rule, and I'll, I'll just kind of go through them quickly and then kind of point out places where that I think are especially significant. Um, nursing facilities are required to report to CMS. So CMS is the federal agency that oversees the Medicare and the Medicaid programs. And then state Medicaid agencies, so Medicaid is a jointly run federal and state program. So state Medicaid agencies would also receive this information. Um, the following information. Each member of the governing body of a facility, uh, each a uh, person or entity who is an officer, director, member, partner, trustee, or managing employee. Significantly on this one, managing employee uh, is, is written to include um, consultants or uh, management services companies. So they don't actually have to be an actual employee of the nursing home 
to ha- to 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 be disclosed in this rule, which is very important for uh, the way that uh, private equity often operates is by bringing in a, an outside management company to manage the facility. They would be included in this in this requirement. Additional disclosable parties also significant because it's looking for. Uh, parties that exercise control over over the facility or who own at least five percent of the real estate that might be le- that is leased to the facility. So again, this situation where a facility has sold its real estate and is now leasing it back, the owners of, of that real estate would now have to be disclosed, uh, or or a, a parties that are providing management or clinical consulting services. Um, the organizational uh, structure of uh, each disclosable party and the interrelationships with one another. Again, the, these are often uh, a very tangled web of, of organizations. So it's important to know how they're how they're all connected to one another. And then importantly, uh, owning the owning and managing entities that are disclosing this information must disclose whether they are a private equity company or a real estate investment trust. So again, targeting specifically um, uh, those those types of businesses uh, for, uh, for uh, as, uh, as targets of this disclosure rule. One other thing that's not on the slide that I did want to add is that um, uh, the the uh, CMS is required to publicly disclose the information uh, that it collects from this rule, uh, within one year of the uh, of of the rule being finalized, so um, the provo- the proposed rule provides uh, much needed transparency. And uh, the letter that that AFR has that that it would love your your sign on to uh, generally expresses uh, broad support for for the rule for uh, all of the reasons that we talked about and the importance of of transparency. Um, there are a couple of additional recommendations in the letter, and just two that I'll mention here are um, that we're, we're asking CMS uh, for its prompt attention to actions that will fully oper- operationalize the rule. Basically, it has to. They're, they're saying that they're they're going to revise a form that nursing homes have to submit to become Medicare providers. Um, and the revision to that, and that, that's how the, that's how this information is going to be provided through this form. And we're urging CMS to make to make those revisions to that form as quickly as they can and to set a timetable for when that revision will be done because in fact, this rule is not effective until uh, until the 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 vehicle for submitting the information is available. So that's very important. And then the second thing that we're asking for uh, is is spe- very specific information about where and how the disclosure information will be made public. I said it's it's required within a year to be public. They don't go into any specifics about where it will be made public. Um, our comments are urging CMS to be very specific, for example, uh, CMS has a website that's called Medical uh, Care Compare, um, where people can go and and you know compare a number of different nursing homes on on various uh, various parameters. We're suggesting that it may av- may be made available there and be made available in a way that would allow people easily to look at not only the ownership of the nursing facility that they're considering, but also some of those interlocking and overlapping ownerships of you know what other facilities might this might this uh, entity own. So those are a couple of the comments uh, that are uh, the suggestions that that AFR is making uh, to the rule. Uh, but as I said, generally um, very supportive of the uh, uh, of the general direction of the of the proposed rule. We think it will. Um, shed uh, uh, some light, some needed light on uh, a pretty dark corner of um, of uh, healthcare and uh, and the ownership of of some of these uh, uh, facilities that are not doing well by by the people who are living there.
I think that's it for me. Um, Ricardo, let me turn it back to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Uh, we will have time uh, for, for you all to ask questions, but I wanted to touch uh, quickly upon uh, how you all can join the fight. Uh, uh, Bob mentioned it's a sign-on letter that a uh, sign-on comment um, and, and walk you through what's in the comment. If you haven't already um, uh, signed on to it, uh, the organizational comment um, uh, was gonna be in the chat. Um, and uh, if you are not an organization, we have also an individual sign on, uh, sign on comment, uh, which has already got 16, over 16,000 signers. So uh, if you're an individual, please feel free to add. You know, we'd love it if you would add uh, yourself there. Um, and then uh, we at AFR convene a, a, a group, a coalition of folks fighting private equity uh, in different parts of the economy. Um, and if you want to be on our listserv, we provide um, uh, you know, updates on industry trends, ways you can get involved, in important uh, uh, research that, that comes out. Uh, and we do that via our listserv. Uh, and you can email me at ricardo at our financial security.org uh, and request to be added to that. Uh, we will be sharing our presentation. Um, uh, this uh, presentation will come in a packet along with a blog post uh, that we just published um, to help you um, communicate out to your to your network uh, and, and share this video um, and this presentation. Uh, and we can also share uh, on social media. We'll have some sample posts for you uh, and we will be posting on social media this week leading up to the end of the comment period. Um, and uh, without, let's see, I think that's what I wanted to hit here and we will open it up for question and answer. It's a pretty small group, feel free to, to just jump in um, or post your question in the chat. Um, I believe you can raise your hand as well. While folks formulate your questions, um, one question uh, I'd like to pose to Bob, um, are there other kinds of rules that we're expecting that can also rein in private equity, uh, private equity's role in healthcare? Uh, aside from this rule that we're pushing, you know, for with a uh, a very you know close uh, comment period ending Friday, mm -hmm. what else should we be on the lookout for? Right, as I mentioned, um, there, there's a uh, there are a number of things uh, going on within the Biden administration triggered by his uh, his comments in last year's State of the Union. Uh, a, a lot of it focused on nursing facilities. Um, one of the uh, one of the other things that we're expecting sometime in the spring is uh, a proposed rule around staffing uh, required minimum staffing levels at at nursing facilities. So um, one of the ways profit obviously is the is the, uh, the 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 difference between revenue and costs. And one of the ways that that um, private equity increases profits is by reducing costs by uh, hiring. Uh, fewer highly skilled nursing staff in in facilities, more uh, lesser skilled folks, um, sort of uh, adjusting the balance there um, that in, in a way that can have an impact on on quality and outcomes uh, in, in the facility. So I think we're expecting to see something. Uh, we've had indications from from the White House that. Um, we may be seeing a rule this spring setting uh, staffing ratios or some sort of a, a, a minimum staffing requirement uh, for nursing facilities that serve Medicare beneficiaries, uh, which is most nursing facilities, um, as, a, as, a, as a requirement. Thanks for that, Bob. I see uh, Lee Goldberg has a hand up. Uh, I will try to unmute you or, or you try to unmute yourself. Oh yeah, hi. Um, I I actually didn't mean to raise my hand, but oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but, but let me just make a comment, which is um, I, I think Bob's comment about the importance of this for the staffing standards is incredibly important because the, the nursing home industry is crying poverty, and yeah. and this is a way to 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 reveal really where a lot of their money is going. I think your comments. I, I haven't looked at your letter yet, but your 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 comments are right on. I think we're going to probably. Um, also make some comments uh, that where we feel like the, the parts of the reg need to be bolstered in some of the definitions, uh, spelling out a little bit more so that um, companies actually have to 
uh, an expanded an expanded definition of what related parties are, and actually having to present an organizational chart, and also having a, a, some language in there about chains, so that um, because so much of it this is you know it's hard to tell when when a nursing home is part of a chain now, and and uh, that needs to be extended. So I think your comments are great, and I hope people sign on to the to your comments. We're just gonna we're gonna add some other points to it. It uh, looks like uh, Maget Diop. I'm so, I'm sorry if I got your name wrong. I see uh, another hand up. Yes, that's that's right. It's Maget Diop. Thank you so much, Ricardo, and thank you as well, Bob. Um, so I'm here with the Service Employees International Union. As you all probably know, we do represent members in nursing homes and um, healthcare facilities. So my question to you is, how do you all perceive? Uh, unions roles in this fight and how can we can, how can we help other than signing on of course what else do you all see that we can do yeah I, I can I can take that um uh, uh we definitely see unions as, as key partners in this fight we have common interests and uh would love to partner with you all um um I'll ask Bob to speak to uh um uh, some other kind of uh, ways we might be able to to take action in in private equity and healthcare um, after we get through all the questions and maybe uh, we can follow up offline to to dig into that. Uh, but we would love to partner with you. Uh, we like I said, we have a coalition of folks who are fighting private equity in different ways, um, uh, and we are you know uh, committed to mobilizing that coalition and working with uh, SEIU and other partners to to coordinate and 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 get stronger to implement some of these changes so I'd love to follow up after perfect thank you tomorrow is the is the deadline for the sign on comment um if there's somebody who who wants to sign on and just needs to get their process you know moving uh, um we can we can you know just let us know and and we can make sure to add you on um, before before sending the letter on, uh, it is tight timeline because the 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 actual you know CMS um, uh, public comment period does close on Friday, so um, there's not too much wiggle room. But um, but definitely reach out uh, to me at Ricardo at uh, ourfinancialsecurity.org, and uh, and we'll we'll work with you. And uh, on the second question about. Um... Uh, enforcement, I guess, is really the, the, the question there, enforcement of the uh, of, of, of the rule. Um, it's a great question. Um, right now, the way that this is set up is that um, uh, this is a, a requirement of any nursing, this will be a requirement of any nursing home that that is uh, uh, applying to be a, a, a Medicare provider or renewing, which is required every every several years, uh, renewing its uh, application to be a Medicare provider. Um, if that information isn't forthcoming or isn't uh, complete or accurate, um, there are uh, provisions, you know, within the Medicare law for uh, for sanctions that 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 would result from that. Specifically on the uh, on this uh, ownership disclosure, I, I would say, um, you know, this is a job for for adv advocacy also to 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 keep the light shown on on this new provision and to monitor to kind of keep an eye on 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 CMS and how it's uh, how it's collecting the information and how it's reporting the information. But there are mechanisms within the broader uh, Medicare. Uh, structure uh, for for uh, enforcing non-compliance with the rule. We will be sending an email out to all participants um, uh, following this uh, that will include a link uh, to this video. Um, I can't answer the question on where it's posted exactly, but um, uh, you will have a, a link in your inbox uh, by the end of the day. There's another question from Susan Rogers um, and asking about what role physicians can play in support of this role? Yeah, that's that's a, a great question. And, and you know, physicians' voices are, I think, critical to, to this fight. And, you know, we uh, work with, uh, we're increasingly working with uh, an organization called Take Medicine Back, who, who um, represents uh, physicians in emergency medicine. And we are trying to make connections with other um, 
you know, groups, uh, whether it's patient advocacy groups and or or um, you know different or, uh, uh, organizations of of different workers in healthcare um, to tell the story to policymakers uh, of what it looks like, you know, from your perspective um, on on uh, and join the fight. So. Uh, you know, we'd love to to talk with you, um, Susan, and 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 uh, talk more about what we can do together. Well, thanks everyone for joining. We appreciate your time. Um, and please feel free to, uh, as I said, um, uh, we will provide a video uh, and a, a, along with our blog post and links. Uh, all the links that were dropped in the chat will be in this uh, packet of information that will come to you. Um, uh, by the end of the day, and uh, please share widely and engage on social media and sign on to whatever uh, of the sign on makes sense and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you.